to the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Stay blessed. So I believe that the Lord is going to grant us grace and help us to understand Scripture. It is important that we study scripture because the Bible represents the boundary of God's commitment to man. God is not committed to man outside of the provisions allocated and allowed by scripture. And that from a child, thou hast known the holy scripture, the Bible says, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation. And so the knowledge of the scripture exposes us to God's methodologies. We're able to understand his way of doing things. And when we sustain the grace to engage accordingly, then our lives become a reflection of what he has said. Many years ago, I had a vision. And in that vision, I saw a great door. It was a very big door. God was opening me up to a thorough understanding of the value of the word of God. I saw an ancient door and the Spirit of the Lord took me close to that door and then I found out that that door was made up of other smaller doors and I noticed in that vision the doors were opening and closing, opening and closing and each time the door opened light will come out of it and then it will close, open again and light would come out of it. And I noticed on every door a scripture was written. And then the Holy Spirit began to let me know that those doors represented revelations and different dimensions of God captured. Remember Jesus said, I am the door. And so every dimension of spiritual reality that you lay hold of, the light that comes is the grace that empowers you to walk in the reality of that scripture. That means whatever you propose to know, if you do not have the grace to demonstrate its validity, it is not yet life to you. It says they are life, not to those that seek them, those that find them. Are we blessed? Praise the Lord. All over the world, believers seek to walk in victory. When you ask the average believer, he will tell you that he wants a consolation to his Christian experience. And while it is true that we do not serve the Lord and we do not seek him because of things, in God's economy, he is so designed that somewhere along the line as you walk with him, you get to a point where your life begins to bear fruit. Are we together? John 15 and verse 8, he says, Herein is my Father glorified. When ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So he desires that somewhere in our Christian experience, we begin to produce results that become an evidence to unbelievers that we are serving a living God as well as become consolations to us. But then results in this kingdom of all sorts, they do not just come because we desire them. They come when we have access to the requisite level of spiritual illumination. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, the Bible says. He lamented and he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you have known even in this your day the things that pertain unto your peace. He says, but now they are hid from you. So there are things that pertain unto our peace. There are things that pertain unto our growth. There are things that pertain unto our efficiency. And I'm trusting that God is going to grant grace as we explore a few keys along the theme of this conference. I read carefully through the letter that um, was written and given to me from the ministry. 
and I could discern the passion of this church for revival, for the move of God, to see that the purposes of God are birthed in a territory like this. And by the grace of God and with all humility, I am a student of revival. I have studied the moves of God across almost every continent. I've had the honor and the privilege of meeting a few of these people and I've heard firsthand from them what God did in their days. Because it is a desire that we become a continuation. Are we together now? A continuation. So that it will no longer be fables that we were told. But we will be able to prove the validity of God to a generation. Otherwise, there will come another generation that knew not Pharaoh. And they will now begin to detest the things that we cherish and hold as sacred. There must be a dimension of spiritual reality that must be preserved. Otherwise, a whole generation will come and detest God. God will become like a historic material. We will just know that once upon a time, there were people in Enugu who were passionate about God. Once, you see, let me tell you this. The way the devil destroys a generation is not to cause a catastrophe in one day or one year. The way the devil destroys a generation is to study its system of continuity. Please understand this. When the devil finds out that the fathers are so covenanted to God, they will not backslide. He will give up on the fathers. But he will make sure the bridge that translates that knowledge and that passion from the fathers to the children is caught. Respectfully speaking, this is what has destroyed the West, the American nations and all of that. Their grandmothers and their grandfathers, those we call God's generals, while they were there in the field doing the things they were doing, the devil distracted them with the here and now, and they did not think of a system of continuity. Are we together? So Satan gave up on the parents and went to grow with the children. Now the children are the presidents, they are the governors, and they are very vocal and unashamed about their desire for the absence of God in their community. It is not enough that we know God. We must study the system allocated for the transference of these things. In ancient times, you would see that the Lord would instruct the fathers. He said, write it on tablets. When your children ask you, why are you doing this? Tell them, once upon a time, something happened like this. Hallelujah. In every generation, God seems to find a few people. Now, I don't know why it is a few people, but I may be able to attempt tonight why it seems like only very few people are able to qualify to host certain superior dimensions of the grace, the power, the glory, the wisdom of God within the context of a generation. So it looks like you have people just being average in their work with God, churchgoers here and there, loving God, serving, and then every once in a while you will find men and women who press exceptionally into the things of God. And as a result of that encounter, they come up with anointings and graces and very, very striking dimensions of God. And those individuals become the, the signposts. They become representations of God's desire within that dispensation. And then when those people leave, usually people go down again and then they wait and one day a Catherine Kuhlman will come up then one day a Smith Wigglesworth will come up and then one day so on and so forth even in the history of this nation and I believe the history of this city when you study from a spiritual standpoint you will find out that scattered across your history were moments when certain individuals came with fire and power and they commanded dimensions of revival and fire. There was such an awakening within that territory. And it is my goal in this conference that I will share with us a bit that the Lord has taught me about preserving the fire of revival within a territory. It is possible that men can capture the realities of God and preserve it transgenerationally. It does not have to be lost with the absence of a generation. 
Are we blessed already? Now, I, I am sent to the body of Christ, as you would have observed. I make it a point of duty to not criticize the body of Christ. It is not my culture at all to talk about maybe churches or say anything negative. No. I am sent to the body. And one of the requirements to carry a grace that is for the body is you must love the body. If you love God and hate the body, you are still defaulting. You must love God and love his body. Are we together? And I have found out that, respectfully speaking, one of the reasons why many people are very weak spiritually, why many people do not host certain dimensions of God, among many reasons, there is a theology that has been sold, especially this generation. And the theology is that there is no participation and there is no price required to host God. And it looks like a well-meaning theology. The Bible is a prophetic book. You can make it speak anything you want it to say. So that, that, that indoctrination that... Um, God can use anybody he wants to use. It doesn't matter who has created a justification for laxity in the body of Christ. So people do not have the passion to press towards the things of God because it looks like there is no profit in pressing into God. Let me tell you this, people of God. Not everything in the kingdom is a gift. If everything were a gift, what then is the reward for obedience? Are we together? Deuteronomy 28, when you read from verse 1, it says, And it shall come to pass if thou shalt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord to do and to observe all that I command you this day. Then it begins to list, it says, Then you shall be exalted above the nations of the earth, and these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. There is always a participatory condition that guarantees certain dimensions of the presence of God. And I think that this, this understanding needs to be restored to the body of Christ. There is a price for spiritual power. There is a price to host God. There is a price to carry an anointing for a generation. There is a real price. It's a non-negotiable price. It's not a price that can be politicized. It's not a price that can be manipulated by emotions. The price is fixed. You either obtain the grace... What God gives is the grace to pay that price. Listen, remember when the mother of James and John came to meet Jesus to negotiate positions for them because the way they saw the invincibility of Jesus and they suspected that one day this man would dethrone Herod and he would become the king of the Jews. And so before that would happen, James and John liars with their mother to buy a comfortable political position for them. Should in case Jesus dethrone Herod, that they will sit at the left and right. And so the mother comes with this request. Dear Jesus, would you grant that after you are done with this Roman people, grant that my sons would sit at your left and right. Jesus never said the space was not vacant. He said, here is the condition. Can you drink? Jesus is talking now, not an angel. Can you drink of my cup? Number one. Number two, can you be baptized? Notice that one walks within you and one walks outside you. Conditions. Can you drink of my cup? And then can you be baptized with my baptism? There is a price for the power of God. You don't just tell somebody from a wheelchair, stand up. Because you read it in the Bible that they shall lay hands on the sick. Remember that many people taught us that it's costly to experiment like this in the Bible. One time Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples wanted to use the opportunity to cash in on that moment and make a name for themselves. And they did not look for a mild case that was manageable. They got an epileptic patient and then they gathered the people and they prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened. They were embarrassed. Their egos were stung. And when Jesus came, they said, why couldn't we cast this out? 
Remember again the sons of Sceva. They came and gathered someone who was a demoniac. And they said in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. That's the real Jesus. You thought he would just show up because his name was called. And the demons replied, Jesus we know. Paul we know. He says, who are you? Where do you stand in the spirit? I do not see the scar that represents your passing through the school of the spirit. And the Bible says those demons beat them and drove them out. Please hear me. You don't just speak and people's lives change because the Bible said, no, no. We will continue to mock ourselves and propose spiritual things we do not have the grace to defend if we are unwilling to pay a real solid spiritual price. The centurion comes to Jesus and is making a request over his daughter. And Jesus said, I respect you. You're a noble man. I will go with you to your house. And the centurion said, no, I am a man under authority. In other words, I understand government and the implication of authority. You too, you are a man under authority. I'm under the authority of the government of Rome. And there is a level of power that I have by reason of that authority. I can tell one, go, and he will go. And if he does not go, the authority that backs me will come to address that situation. And Jesus said, I have not found such revelation. Who mentored you? Who taught you this? That our exploits in the kingdom is based on the government we submit to. Where did you find this revelation? There is a lot, and I'm saying this respectfully, there is a lot of talking in the body of Christ. There is a lot of proposition of what God can do. God can heal. God can change your life. And then we keep saying amen, amen. But our frustrations continue to grow because it's like the more we are attending church, the more we are getting away from God. There is no consolation to the reality of the power of God. Psalm 63, David began to speak and he said, Oh God, thou art my God. He says, Early will I seek you. My soul longs for you. My heart pants for you as in a dry and weary land. He says to see your power and your glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. Let me tell you this. Our churches and our appeals are under attack. If we do not bring the demonstration of the reality of heaven here and now, a day will come your child will look at you and say, until the day you prove the reality of Jesus, do not talk to me about church again. The generation of our fathers is a generation of loyalty. Even if they don't believe you, they have a covenant of loyalty. They will pray for you and leave you in your confusion while they believe you. This generation is an arrogant, scientific generation. They will not believe without results. The Bible says the Greek look for a sign. This is the reason why our teenagers today have such an obsession for the things, technology and all of this and they detest God. You mention anything God. They are in church, they are browsing. They, they absolutely, you are there crying about an encounter you had for years. And they, they cannot relate to this. The devil is coming as a bridge between yesterday and tomorrow. And if we do not restore the authentic power and the grace of God to our pulpits and the church, we will be surprised. Are we together? I don't mean to bring bad memories. Forgive me if I do. But how many of you had the opportunity to watch warehouses that were boggled during this palliative time? No invitation. No poster. There was something in that building that people passionately desired. And they were not ashamed to leave their houses and climb roofs. What if what is in that house is in your church? Spiritually speaking. Listen, now forgive me. I came to do something to you. We will apologize after the conference. Are we together? The rate at which we beg people to come to church, 
the rate at which we lavish money on publicity, the rate at which we are on our knees pleading, is a sign that something is not authentic in what we are communicating. Jesus is with a woman by the well. And then he began to speak to her. Discerning he was a prophet, she began to ask him on the subject of worship. And when Jesus responded to this woman, watch this. The Bible says this woman went and called back. Do you know the gospel was designed that if it really impacts you, you cannot be silent. There were people who Jesus begged and said, don't tell anybody. They were too grateful to be quiet. There is something about the reality of this faith life we propose that is not yet true in our lives. Now, this is not an insult. Believe us, we are challenging ourselves. If it is true that we desire the spirit of revival in this conference, then we have to be serious. The sick come sick. And we say Jesus can heal. And then we share the grace. And while they are on their way going home, here comes Satan. It's not only Jesus he tempted. He will follow everybody and say, does this look like that revelation of love? The more we read the Bible, the more we do not see him in our, in our churches. I was young and now I am old, we say. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread. But is that not a lie? How many believers beg for bread every day? We seem to be at the mercy of situations and circumstances. Watch this. A charm is placed on the ground. That charm did not ask me whether I believe in it or not. I match it on my way going. The charm did not ask whether I have faith or not. And it still affected me. Can you imagine that? I'm giving you an example of the experience of many Christians. A charm is on the ground. The charm did not ask you, do you believe I will hurt you? Uh -uh. It didn't care whether you believed or not. And you matched it and all of a sudden something began to happen to you. Oh God, restore your glory and your power back to the church. There are too many things we propose without the grace requirement to defend them. And the world used to be quiet, but now the world is beginning to ask questions. Oh dear church, they will search for scriptures and say, come and defend it. You told us that God can restore. Here is a woman with 23 years of captivity and all her life she's been serving the purposes of God. Can you prove to us that God restores? And we stand there quoting scripture and saying all kinds of things and the onlooker who is looking says, this is your Jesus, there is a question mark. Is God challenging someone tonight? There is no continent that prays like Africa. And yet we are the ones in need of results every day. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Are we together? Financially speaking, there are many, many believers who are in situations, they are givers, they love God, they tithe, they sow, they give, and yet in a shocking way, they never rise to a notable dimension. I'm not talking of just having your needs met. That's not prosperity. You don't need God for that to happen. You just need wisdom. Not even the wisdom of the word. Sophia, the wisdom that comes by studying the laws of nature. I share with you my contemplations and I share with you what began to lead me to seek for God beyond church, to seek for God beyond religion, to seek for God beyond Bible studies and prayer meetings. I knew something was wrong. The Bible says, Proverbs 18 and verse 1, through desire, a man, having separated himself, he said, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom.
something is wrong. I won't take too much of your time, but I need to challenge you. When we talk about revival, did you know for the average person, we don't even have an idea of what we're talking about. We just feel, oh, a time when people will just pray for a few minutes and then backslide whenever they feel like doing, and then we just know that in 1995, there was such a move of God. No, sir. And yet we say the path of the justice as a shining light that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Let God be true. Let God be true. Enugu State, let God be true. My experience is too small to validate who God is. If, if my experience does not capture all the dimensions of God, I cannot create a theology out of my limitation to mean God cannot do it. God will not bend to us. We are the ones who will bend to say, Lord, I take responsibility. There is something about my Christian experience that is not capturing the fullness of you. Are we blessed? Yes. Oh, I am a prophet. God called me to be a prophet. Every prophetic word is wrong. It didn't come to pass. Everything you say is wrong. Your name is John. He said, no, my name is not John. But something is wrong. Look, let me tell you this. Listen, I'm not being sarcastic. I want to be sincere with you. It takes humility and brokenness to admit. Don't fake what can be real. Insist and say something is wrong. I may not know what is right, but oh God, come to me. The strength of God does not look for strength. The strength of God looks for weakness. When it finds strength, it will go back until there is a broken and a contrite heart. Having said all this, let me announce to you that revival is real. Having said all this, let me announce to you that God is still in the business of making men and shifting territories and continents. Just because that reality may not be captured in your space personally does not mean God stopped working because of you. You may have stopped pressing into God, but he did not stop moving people. There are people who, who did not graduate themselves from that school. They said, Lord, I ever remain a student. And God has continued to advance the frontiers of the kingdom through them. And it is my prayer and my desire tonight that God will cultivate a hunger and a passion greater than ministry title, greater than preaching, greater than conferences, a depth of hunger to host and deliver a dimension of kingdom reality that dumbfounds principalities and powers. While you are seated, can you pray in one minute and say, Lord, plant a dissatisfaction in my heart. Plant a dissatisfaction. I'm tired of Greek and Hebrew words without a grace to demonstrate their validity. Please pray. Please pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart. This is 25 years of the faithfulness of God. There has to be a dimension of substance to our Christian experience. Someone is praying. Someone is crying to the God of heaven. Call upon me, he says, and I will answer. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Pray for one minute. Shela parus kada branda kada bala haske de bala. Lord, we desire to see your power and your glory in Enugu State once again. We desire our altars to be places of fire. We desire to see sinners saved with forceful power. We desire to see a reign of signs and wonders again. We cannot lose this heritage. There must be a generation that becomes a continuation of this.
Please pray. Hallelujah. Listen. Please listen. I went to church and I had my pastors preach from scripture. They said many things about God. They said God is love. I heard them preach scriptures like if you've been evil, know how to give good gifts. How much more your heavenly father. I preach, I heard them preach messages like he has been made the head of all principalities. But I could not see the substance, the validation of that which was said. While they were preaching, I was watching the sick who sat close to me. I was watching families I knew were in trouble. Where is this God we are talking about? And then we say he's in our midst. Let's worship him. And we finish and sit down. And I say, but when God came in the Bible, I know what happened. I read my Bible. The Bible says the mountains keep like lambs when he comes. And yet he is there and we are browsing, pinging on our phones. Is it the God of heaven? Even angels, when they appeared, the impact was too much for men to ignore them. Something is wrong. The Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest and Christ shall give you life it was while men slept that the enemy came something happened to them once upon a time they were awake the enemy... but for three and a half years it was a system of mentorship every day to the point that even when Jesus died he didn't finish the lecture with them as soon as he resurrected he said there's no time to celebrate that let's go back to the lecture for 40 days he continued teaching them because by the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was going to come and he needed to prepare them on certain matters of the kingdom. And so I want to show you a few keys. First from scripture, then from the lives of people who have been mightily used by God through history. And then some of these things have graciously been proven in my own life. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. It's a scripture that I found. It says, My son, give me thine heart and let thy eyes observe my ways. The first two words is a declaration of an acknowledgement. You are my son. That means on legitimate grounds, you qualify to be a partaker of everything that I have. My son, not a stranger, my son. Then give me your heart. There are not many times God demands things from men. But every time God does demand a thing from a man, it is because he's preparing him to receive something higher and greater. And he says, my son, you want to be used as a general to the nations. My daughter, my church, my territory. If you want to be mightily used by God, listen to me. The first key is not anointing. The first key is not fasting. The first key is not prayer. The first key is not Bible study. You can do all those things and yet miss it. Because many have tried it and it did not work. The first key to being mightily used by God is the state of your heart. The state of your heart vetoes your prayer life. The state of your heart vetoes your fasting. Every other thing finds its credence from the purity of your heart. Are we together? My son, I desire to use you, but the state of your heart. Do you know why God is always after the heart of men i will tell you why because in his design of man he created the heart of man to be able to host him and him alone and in that design whatever finds its way to your heart is your god 
please observe this your god is not what you worship your god is whatever finds a place in your heart it doesn't matter what you worship physically in the realm of the spirit they know what you bow to not by searching a deity they search your heart god designed the heart of a man to be the mirror of his allegiance whatever can have access to that holy of holies in your heart qualifies to be your god are we together so he created the heart of man to be able to host him and his purposes so when you sing and when you preach before heaven takes you seriously the word of god that is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart will have to vet the purity of your heart god does not just accept worship because it is melodious god does not my son give me your heart complete surrender please read with me if you can see it otherwise i'll just read it from here the bible says the heart is deceitful above all things stop before you understand this scripture, you have to array the many things that can be deceptive. One of the things that is deceptive is the serpent. Now the serpent was more... Your heart can deceive you into believing something that is not true. The heart is deceitful above all things. And the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Oh God, bless me and you will see what I will do for the kingdom. And God says, I don't need to bless you to see it. I'm already seeing it now. Because you see, in God's realm, I hope you know that God, how do I say this now? God does not live in eternity. No. I hope you know eternity is also a function of time. Eternity just means time without end. It's a summation of infinite dispensations, but it's still subject to time. God's realm is not in time God's realm is not even in eternity. God's realm is not even heaven. He just put his throne there. Read your Bible. It says in the beginning God created. That means he was not there. You can't create what you are inside. In the beginning, where was he? He created the heavens and the earth. That means he was, he was in neither of the places. The realm of God is called light. It's a realm that the Bible says is unapproachable light. Now, please understand this. In that realm, there is no time and there is no distance. In that realm, there is no future and there is no past. Those realities don't exist in that realm. Everything is called now. So your tomorrow is seen already. Are, are, are you together now? Now, you see, in this realm, you don't know what I can become tomorrow. I may be broke today and so my being well behaved may not be a true picture of my heart condition it's just that the situation has forced me to carry a posture of humility so men can call you humble until the day you see the heart of man hides evil like a dna it does not be, it does not get activated until the conditions there are sufficient conditions that make certain levels of evil to be activated if you have never tasted fame you may not know that you can be derailed so you can just say god forbid i love god with all my heart remember you've never been honored you've never stood before kings this is why criticizing people is dangerous when you hear that someone is not doing well go back to your own altar and say god before i disgrace myself vet my heart now search my heart try my thoughts let me tell you this listen to my message why revivals die there is only one reason why revivals die not sin no the humanity of men is the reason why revivals die revivals die because the custodian of that revival is a man and satan knows that there is something in a man prophet isaiah began to observe it and he says has thou not known has thou not seen he says the everlasting god the lord creator of the ends of the earth does not faint neither is he weary this is a quality that is prevalent with men satan knows that no matter how powerful i am i will be tired one day he knows that so when he tries to attack your vision from the beginning and it does not work he will leave you you will think you are free he left Jesus for a while. He waited till they offended him, till Jesus was on his way to the cross. Here he comes again. Satan is any other thing but a fool. 
he has an advantage of time the bible calls him that old serpent he has lived through dispensation and he has studied man like an experiment he knows man in and out so when he sees you as a preacher with your zeal he knows there is no money in your pocket yet you've never flown a first class you don't know what it means to be honored so you don't even have any ego to be stung so you think you are humble and satan waits for you at the corridor of your lifting he knows there is something with men that both glory and shame produces the same result it can frustrate you Are we together? Yes. So the day you lead the prayer and mighty things begin to happen. Do you know Alexander the way? The first time they called him Elijah, he rebuked them. He said, no, I can't be Elijah. This humility. But over time, he thought to himself and said, but honestly, come to think of it, who else? Because at that time, there was no internet. You will not even know God is also walking at the other side of your ignorance. God knows men very well. That's why he does not trust what you say till he sees what is in your heart. Have you not seen men who say, I will stand with you forever. I will build maybe a ministry or I will be with you in politics. I must vote you. And while they are saying that, quarter to their to when you will need them they will change god knows the ever-changing nature of men so he does not trust anything you say i hope you know while you sing your heart is also singing while you preach your heart is also preaching the sermon of your heart is greater than that of your lips let the words of my mouth he says and the meditation of my heart let you the restrictions in your life will god can give you oh dear God can say for the next three years, from 12 to 3, that is the time I have a portion to meet with you. Don't miss it. And by 11.30, you are tired and it's as if you will die. He wants to teach you how to give up on your own strength and tap into his own. Because the schedule that you have in ministry will require that knowledge. There is a spiritual architecture he's teaching you. That they that wait upon the Lord, there is a system where weak men can become strong. So when he wakes you when you are tired, it's not wickedness. It's the training that makes mighty men. So that when you have a busy schedule in the future, they see you standing. From whence cometh this unusual strength? Oh, Samson. And Samson said, it is not my physical might. There is a spirit that can manifest as the spirit of might. Listen. There are dimensions of God you can never learn in church. You will never understand it. It is your experience that will educate you into who God is. A testimony that you will have by yourself. Your training will give God a name that your generation will call. The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, they were not generic names. They were an encapsulation of the experiences of men with God. Your assignment is to use your lifetime to give God a name that your children can call. What name is your experience giving God? You only know the God of Abraham. I congratulate you. But when will your experience give him a name that others can call? So there are people who will stand and lift up one song and his Shekinah will fill that place because the altar upon which their training was built is alive. There is an altar in the realm of the spirit. There is a covenant that they have with God. There are realms that cannot be imparted. It's a well you must dig through your pain and your sacrifice. We live in a generation where we like receiving everything by impartation. No, sir. Ali Saradusa has kabariata. Apostle, God is calling me to be a kingdom financier. And one day God says, aside from the clothes you are wearing, fold everything in a bag and sew it. 
you will cast that spirit thinking it's a demon. It will come again. God speaks once, but you don't hear only once. He will make you hear as many times as your unbelief wants. Listen, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Let me tell you, when you see people who truly carry authentic power and grace, find out the story behind their training. God you are my God Early, timing matters in seeking God because it takes time to know him early will I seek you my soul longs for you when I began my experience with God I was not looking for fame I was not looking for power I was just tired I said Lord we cannot serve a God we don't know to a generation we give a generation a gift to the unknown God a God we do not know. A God who our proposition about him, we are not sure. You finish preaching a message, man of God, very boldly. And you go back to your room and secretly say, I hope I understand what I just said. Paul said, but I know whom I believe. I am persuaded. It's the reason why many people cannot die for Jesus. Because we are not even sure of what we are living for. Time will fail me to talk of Gideon and Jephthah and Barak, men who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, shut the mouth of lions. And the Bible says that they without us would not be complete. Hear me, truly speaking, there is a generation rising. Jesus will not return until there is a manifestation of that power. I have seen it. I have seen it many times in my vision that Africa, God's firstborn, the stone that has been rejected the stone that identified with Jesus on his way to the cross every continent rejected Jesus except Africa in a man called Simon of Cyrene that was Africa carrying the cross for Jesus and since we partook of his sufferings we must also partake of his glory it is the reason why Africa will become the centerpiece of revival says I beseech thee brethren by the message of God Romans 12 and verse 1 that he offer your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God he calls it your reasonable act of worship then he says to not be conformed to this world it's a Greek word aeon the thinking pattern that comes with this system it says but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove that which is good and perfect will of God bring them out you call it a wind of revival and ignition God is doing something not only in this church but even in this city hallelujah now please watch this forgive me I hope I'm not breaking any protocol please forgive me if I do but in the name of Jesus the Christ of God I'm seeing fire just rising from this place and I'm seeing it come on people those people will start running out by themselves please hold them so they don't injure anybody I'm seeing a grace it's a grace that will drive you to the secret place Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 stand in the ancient parts ask for that part that ancient part My son, give me your heart. Man of God, give me your ministry. Give me your reputation. This is the prize for all of me. This is the prize for commanding power in the spirit.
wherever you are in one minute can you just open your mouth and begin to pray in the spirit Lord I'm ready to hand over everything let tonight be a handover service Listen, hallelujah. In the next five minutes, please hear me. I'm going to leave you and your maker. I don't know how you are going to cry before God in the next five minutes. I leave you alone with God and say, Father, search my heart, try my thoughts. You know the tendencies that are in my heart. Prune my heart, oh God. Take away flesh, take away pride, take away vain glory from my life. Purify my heart in truth. The next five minutes, cry before your maker. Any good state, are you praying? Say, cry that brings revival. I want to know your way. I want to know your way. Two more minutes. Take everything, oh God. Everything that has taken your place. Until Jesus is seen and glorified in my life. Take everything, oh God. more minutes don't be tired of crying you came here for an awakening I surrender all to you everything I give to you I'm withholding nothing withholding nothing I surrender all to you everything I give to you I'm withholding nothing withholding nothing Keep myself away. Keep myself away so you can use me. I keep myself away. In my The Bible says, seeing then that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth easily beset us and to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking up to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame lift your voice and say father anything that has taken your place in my life 
I dethrone it in this conference. Everything that has taken your place in my life, whether it is relationships, whether it is material things, whether it is ministry, whatever it is, please pray. I dethrone everything. We are rounding up. Please pray. I will lay down my idols and thrones I have made and all that has taken my heart. Lord, I will lay down my idols and thrones I have made everything that I stake in my heart sing Lord I will bow I will bow to you to no other God but you Lord I will worship Nothing has happened. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Truly there is nothing I desire compared with you. One more time and you go lift your voice, lift your voice and let's sing this song. Lord, you are more precious than diamond. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than time. There is nothing on fire for you. Come and make my heart your home. Come and be everything I am and all I know. Here's the part. Search me through and through till my heart becomes Jesus one more song and we're done for tonight's meeting I lay it all down again to hear you say that I help me find a way would you bring me back to you? Oh, 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 oh. your heart, my Lord. Mean it from the depth of your heart. Your heart, your heart, my Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and its fullness thereof, 
the walls and they that dwell therein for he has founded it upon the waters and established it upon the seas and then the bible says who shall ascend to the hill of the lord and who shall stand in his holy place he says he that hath clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive a blessing from the lord and righteousness from the god of his salvation then he says this is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face O jacob father we are praying in this place tonight we lay down our pride we lay down our ambitions we lay down our reputations for your glory we lay down our personal desires oh god every weight that besets us we lay it down we desire to see you glorified in this church we desire to see you glorified in enugu state father no matter what you are doing in africa don't leave us behind may we be part of your program as you are raising generals so god do not leave enugu out as you are raising mighty revivalists do not leave this state out there's gonna be a great awakening it's my prophecy to this state there's gonna be a great revival in your land there's gonna be a great awakening and everyone who calls on jesus they will that people will begin to get born again in the market they will get born again in the banks they will get born again in schools the fire of the holy ghost will begin to fall upon your streets the fire of revival will begin to fall in small groups prayer warriors will begin to arise little groups will begin to arise men and women of fire women who are like deborah will begin to arise in this city women of fire who understand the ordinances of the spirit dearly beloved i hope you were blessed by this message i want you to keep doing something for this man of god our man of god apostle joshua salmon and that is i want you to keep on praying for him that the cause of the gospel may have free flow in him that he may be granted boldness to continue with his commission of jesus christ and that all provisions be given unto him as he continues in this journey of christianity and then don't forget to like this video don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you are new here don't also forget to leave a comment in the comment section and then keep sharing keep sharing abroad and let's all keep sharing jesus i'll see you again bye